Um, we're in Malta and we're going to discuss these Carta Gloria. They're very unusual things. For me, I'm English. In England, you don't see them. You, if you wanted to find them in England, you would be looking for a hell of a long time. They're not something that are in the Protestant homes or churches, and they're only collected and used by the some of the Catholic families and some of the Catholic churches. So they're alien to me. Now I bought them because I like them, and they're visually beautiful. Um, I, I first thought they were a triptych, which is a set of three panels, which you would often find in England in the med medieval times, especially not only in churches, <clears throat> you'd find three pictures or panels. And the, even in mod modern uh, and 20th century art, you do find three pictures presented as a triptych, which may be joined together or hinged, um, which could be closed up, and taken away. Uh, often they are separate. So I thought they were, they were, they were a triptych, but they're not a triptych, they're Carta Gloria, in fact, the frame isn't Carta Gloria. The prayer inside is, is the Carta Gloria. And it's basically a holy prayer. And the, these frames were not stuck on a wall, wall in a church near the altar as a permanent fixture. They were brought out on the appropriate occasions, which would have been a mass, and they were put away for other, for other occasions, and there's a lot of technical details, I don't know all the ins and outs, but that's basically the story. I had thought that there would be a leg on the back if they were for um, mounting on the altar, or standing on the altar, but there is no, on these, there is no leg, and I don't think there is a leg on any of them at all. It's just, a, it's just, what, the, just what there would be. So they, they have a way of displaying them on an altar. So just to recap, Carta Gloria are the prayers, inside the frame. I didn't buy them for the prayers, I bought them for the frame. And these frames are the frames for Carta Gloria. I'm not going to split them however, but you could quite easily see that being made into a pair of mirrors of significant value. You could quite easily see that being made into a picture frame of sorts or a mirror of sorts. But it would be a bit of a shame to vandalise them, so I'm not going to vandalise them. The frames are carved wood and they are trying to look like 17th century frames, the onset of Rococo. Rococo. And um, they're beautifully made, they're simple, and they're made, as I say, of carved wood. If you look at the back, you, you'll see the construction is basic. And if I had to think of a, one, one place where you see that colour of paint, I would say Florence. I don't think they are from Florence though. I think they're probably Maltese. The, the, the carving is rounded and simple. It's adequate and it's beautifully done. So it's slightly provincial. Some of the Florentine carving, some of it is crisper, not all of it. Um, so it could be Italian, it could be Florentine, it could be Maltese. I know that's not very satisfactory, but that's the limit of my knowledge. I think that um, it's possible the paint is the same paint as the undercoat of the gold leaf, which would be called bol, B-O-L-E, or in Italy it would be called bolo, and Malta would be called bolo. And what they do is they take the pine, they slather the whole thing with gesso, which is glue and plaster, and they use the gesso to fill the, the fibrous nature of the wood. They will use many coats of the gesso, varying consistencies of glue. There's more glue near the wood and less glue away from the wood near the top. They sand the gesso down, they apply a bowl. The bowl is the undercoat of wood. It is the adherent which makes the, the, the water, the gilding, the gilding stick to the gesso. So one more time, pine carved, gesso, a dozen to 20 coats. It smooths out the wood, makes a platform for the gilding. Before the gilding is put on, they have to put the glue on. The glue is applied hot with coloured clay and rabbit skin glue. On this occasion they've used a yellow bowl and <clears throat> the bowl is put on in one or two coats, it's sanded again, and then they apply the, 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 the gold leaf. You can see there's two overlapping lines here. 
which means they've used gold squares that size. And the overlap is narrow, which means it's been put on by a skilled gilder. It's not gold paint, it's gold leaf. It's water gilded real gold leaf. It's not fake gold leaf. It's too old for fake gold leaf. And it's yellow and bright still, even though it's rubbed. And um, so they, before they put the gold leaf on, of course, they wet, they wet the bowl, which would be dry. And there's enough, the glue will become slightly soluble with the cold water. The gold leaf is attractive to moisture, which sticks to the gesso, it dries, and then it's burnished. So it's, it's well burnished onto a nicely made, simply made gesso bowl base, simply carved. The crevices aren't deep, it's nicely done. The bowl, I think they will have used the same paint, the bowl, to do the whole thing. The bowl on the back, if it is, if it is bowl, has glue in it as well, it would hold it together. These uh, are made of pieces of wood stick to get stuck together, not one piece of wood. It's made in a kit form like nearly all the Florentine mirrors you get. I've licked, I've licked the consistency to see if it's sticky. It's slightly sticky. I can't say for sure it's bowl. There's enough stick in it, stickiness in it, to hold the gold leaf. But usually, usually if you test the back for bowl, it's very sticky, really quite quickly. The um, they have these feet on them, which you see in France and Italy. And if the frame was an ordinary frame, the gone wall, you might see a different type of bottom. So it has got this standing up thing going on. And if you go to England and look at Edwardian silver mirrors, for example, or France, or even Art Deco mirrors, dressing table mirrors, um, you'll see they have feet on them like this. And they have a wider platform on the bottom and often you have this leg on the back, which is why I was looking for a leg. This is the larger one. <clears throat> the glass has a join in it, so I don't understand why. They've economised on the glass, maybe it's been broken and they only had some spare glass pieces, the church perhaps. So I, I think this was owned by a church. I don't necessarily think it was owned by an individual. I, th I think it's possible that it, it could have been owned in Malta by a chapel owner. Many houses in Malta has chapels and have chapels and some chapels in Malta were freestanding buildings within the grounds of the house. They might be at the end of the garden with a lovely little roof on. It might be a, a wing joined onto the house where you walk into it and it'd be a chapel. Sometimes they're on the roof on the second or third floor, often in the middle over the, over the door to, make, to, keep, to keep symmetry if it was that sort of house. But in Malta, they also had a very strange indoor chapel, often in, in bedrooms, where you would have a bedroom with four doors, a door to a landing, a door to a bathroom, a door to, to your spouse's bedroom, perhaps, and a door to what looks like a wardrobe. But you'd go to this other door, the fourth door, or it could be a second door, you'd open it and you'd step into a small chamber, five or six foot square, on, and in, in that chamber, in the bedroom, there would be an altar, a lantern, uh, plaster work, an, an area to kneel, a preja, which is a, basically a desk with a kneeling area, might be a pull-out drawer, a crucifix, and this sort of stuff. So chapels in Malta were fairly widespread and they were observed and used by the household and the family and visitors, I imagine. So, it, so when I say it might have been a church, it doesn't necessarily mean a big church with a congregation. It could have been in a chapel, a big chapel, or a small private chapel. The, they're, they're very unusual, and they're hellishly expensive. Um, this is this set is a malt for sale, and um, decoratively, if you forget the ecclesiastical religious aspects, decoratively it's absolutely incredibly beautiful. And um, so it's so unusual, and it, and it evokes it evokes a sort of bygone era, and and and, uh, and sort of Christian habits which are largely gone, and in, in some places, and I, I think if, if it, I, I think that this set will be eighteen ninety, very possibly a little bit earlier. It, it's limited in age by the printed prayers. I, I think it's likely. They are the original prayers, not necessarily 
I think a push, if, you, if I imagined those away, and someone said, how old are those? I, I, I just think I, I would actually be saying they were probably early, early 19th century. So they could be earlier with later prayers in, but not 20th century. They, they have a patina, they have rubbing. The rubbing is, is too authentic to be fake rubbing. You have this yellow bowl, which is unusual, we've talked about, which has a Florentine feeling to it. This is another item with a yellow bowl. That's the undercoat. You will not find a lot of yellow bowl around when you are looking for, looking at um, bowl, B-O-L-E. Usually you, you will find it's red bowl. That one there, actually I think it's yellow as well. I'll just find something with, yellow, with red bowls to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. I can't find anything around. Um, Here. This picture has a red bowl. Sorry, wasting my time. This is a red bowl. You can see here. So, bowl is coloured clay only with rabbit skin glue only. And that's the substance that makes the gold leaf stick to the gesso. Okay, I think we've covered it. Thanks for having a look.